I'm Becky Becker, I'm the gallery coordinator and education manager here at the Sheldon Art Galleries. So thanks for being here this morning. We've had a fun week with Carly, <laughs> <laughs> being here to install, and I'm just going to read her little bio. So, Carly Slade grew up in Big Sky, Alberta, Canada. She received her MFA from San Jose State University and her BFA from the Alberta College of Art and Design. Her work is influenced by her blue collar roots and flanked by a concern for the precarious nature of the working class. Using a mix of materials mostly, including clay, embroidery, and building supplies, Slade, Slade sorry, <laughs> creates dioramas of real places in an unreal perspective. Carly is currently visiting or I make you associate, oh. assistant professor hey, at the so University that. of Wyoming, <laughs> Laramie, Wyoming. Thanking uh, the Sheldon, and especially shout out to Paul and Becky for having me here. I've had a super fun week, and I hope they have. I've been keeping them up late <laughs> and asking them all sorts of wild questions. So thanks, guys. This has been fabulous. So uh, I'm going to start off by talking a little bit about me and my background because it really influences the work that I do. And yeah, I wish I did have a pointer. So I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. This is that red dot there. Um, have you guys ever heard of Alberta? Yes. Yeah. What does Alberta make you think of? Calgary and Banff. This is great. So oil is the answer to that question. <laughs> but I'm glad that people don't like immediately go there uh, anymore right now. So when I was growing up in Alberta, I would say that the oil was very boom and bust. Um, Alberta is a city, or sorry, Edmonton is a city of just under a million people, very blue collar, is the capital of Alberta. Uh, my parents worked in the trades, I worked in the trades, all my friends and family did, and it just became a big part of my life. Boom, I'm cute. So, <laughs> thank you. I keep wanting to get rid of this picture because the baby pictures look so cliche, but it's so cute. Look at those cheeks. <laughs> um, so when I was growing up, I became really aware of these economic influences outside of my home that were really affecting my home. I remember one Christmas, three of my bears and my blankie all gave me gifts. The oil market was up and things were like doing well. And I remember some Christmases not getting many presents. I remember my dad having to go to town to work to find jobs. And I remember stress in the house. So just starting to be aware of this idea of this American dream, or for me, the Canadian dream. And is it obtainable, is it real, when it doesn't matter, you can be working as hard as you can, doing all the right things, so these exterior forces can affect you. So while I was also growing up, I worked in construction on and off for 10 years, so here is Thor, I am installing natural gas lines to residential houses. In my undergrad, I would work six tenths, so six days a week, 10 hours a day, installing gas lines. And then over there, I co-owned a precast concrete shop. So I've always been interested in labor, this is also a time when I really started collecting lots of materials. So I'd come home every day from doing gas lines with my coveralls, which just the pockets would be full of like pipes and wire and rope and all these like beautiful little things. I felt like a bird just like collecting bits. But I'm interested, I mean, I've, I've always been a ceramic artist, and that is like my main love. But I'm also really interested in materiality and something as simple as like uh, dead and blue jeans versus whatever suits are made out of fabric, like just those two fabrics alone have such different kind of meaning behind them. So I started playing with those things. So I think a lot about people and a lot about the spaces they inhabit. I think about people in each other's spaces, spaces after people have left, about who makes the space, people who have lost their space, about what they've left behind or maybe took with them. Am I interested in space as both an archive and a facade? So I moved to the States eight years ago for grad school, and since then I've lived in eight different states. And I hate moving, and I hate change, and I hate goodbyes, but that's what kind of early professoring dictates that you do. And it's cool that I've gotten to like meet all these lovely people and move across the country. And every time I move, I kind of look to the buildings as these like signposts to like explain to me kind of what's going on. I talk a lot about that in my artist statement in the show. Uh, and I think of buildings as these kind of vessels, and on the inside it kind of like keeps those lives and stories 
And then on the outside, it said marked by all the people that live there. So this is a gas station in downtown Calgary, Alberta, Canada, that I became really enamored with. I made this piece for my studio in San Jose in grad school. Um, it was downtown, in the rough part of downtown, but still high rent. It's like this empty lot with this old vintage gas station on it. And I always kind of thought, like, how is that place paying for that lot, or what's going on there? I also would get gas there during the day, but I would never go at night. And I started thinking a lot about when space is available to different people, and like the gendering and ownership of space. Um, I started using a lot of lights in my work, so these all have LED lights in them. I read a fantastic paper in grad school talking about the democratization of space with the advent of streetlights, and I've been thinking a lot about that. Like, you know, something simple as walking to your car at night through a dark parkade versus a lit parkade. A parkade is a parking structure. Americans. Because <laughs> this place used to be a parkade, and I keep saying parkade, and everybody keeps looking at me crazy. But, you know, something as simple as that, I think, is quite interesting. And also that public lighting is something that we do communally. So, I got really into materials, like I said, these are old, nasty pieces of foam that I found outside, and I carefully mitered them so they became these, like, really beautiful. So thinking about the valuing of different materials, like high and low materials, so something like an old dirty foam is probably pretty low. Um, but I think it's beautiful and has a lot of interest. More LED lights. This is a um, bike inner tube that I've sewn together and then put a little dotted line on. So thinking about that kind of like long road and the journey to get there. Embroidery is something that you'll start to see a lot about and we'll talk more about. So that propane tank I've embroidered. It's so weird seeing it big, because this is like this big. And you can actually take these things off and like gas up your tiny car. <laughs> Although the day I opened it, a friend of mine came and I was like, you can take them off. And he just went, oh. broke it. No, oh, it's okay. Sort of. <laughs> I made extra. That's why you make extra in ceramics. So this was my halfway through grad school. The show's called Blue Language. Um, I have a bit of a dirty mouth. And I've heard, I've heard being called Blue Language, and I really like that, and just kind of that idea of this dialect amongst these people. So, here too, these are all buildings from Canada. It took me a while to be able to make American buildings, because I'm not of this country, and I don't, I felt weird making somebody else's buildings, and had to kind of come to terms with this. So this is actually the building that my concrete shop was in for about three years. This is a closet. This is this really amazing diner we used to go to. But again, lots of mixed media. Upholstery, found metal, different plastics and wood. I have kind of power lines in my work. I think a lot about the labor that goes kind of unvalued and unsung until something goes wrong. And then you notice it. Like, you don't really think about your power turning on and off until it doesn't turn on, and then you're pissed off that it doesn't turn on. But hundreds of man hours of time and effort and ideas have gone into putting electricity in your house. It's crazy. Like your sink, water, like all of that is just like really amazing. And then also, uh, oh I missed out early on. I'm trying to go without those. I missed a little bit. I grew up in a union household. My dad's an electrician, my brother's an electrician, my mom worked for the school board. So electrical stuff I think I always am just like a bit drawn to because of that legacy. More materials. This is a uh, Mustang bumper that I found on the side of the highway in San Jose and then bent up and riveted and I just really like the shape of it. This is carpet pad, under pad, carpet under pad. More embroidery. This is the metal that goes um, when you put together uh, the installation of a stove. Sometimes I'll just like go to Home Depot, get a Starbucks and just like walk around and like find interesting materials. I also love a dumpster. Get lots of good art at the dumpster, the side of the road. This is a little closet that I made. These are little rubber bands for bushes. So here, um, I do a lot of my own embroidery, but I also do a lot of found embroidery. I'll go to thrift stores and just buy old embroidery. Often it's gonna get thrown out, which makes me incredibly sad because somebody spent hundreds of hours making that embroidery. It's like full of love and it's labor. And I think that society is finally kind of pushing past this gender binary that we have, but I think a lot of the world is still mired in that, and will be for the forthcoming future, foreseeable future. Um, and I think that that applies to labor as well. So I think something like 
embroidery is often thought of as like women's work and hobby work and busy work. So I think that, that you don't often see that in a gallery setting. Whereas if a man chiseled a mahogany table, you put that in a gallery all day. Even though the embroidery would be way cooler. So one of the cool things that artists get to do is we get to decide what goes in a gallery. And then when it's in a gallery, everybody else goes like, oh, I guess that's supposed to be in a gallery. So I like to take these pieces of embroidery and put them in my work and put them in a gallery where I like believe that they should exist. So you'll see that I do that a lot. I do this in this piece. So I moved to um, Helena, Montana to do a residency at the Archie Gray there, and there was this abandoned Chinese restaurant that I always kind of looked at and had a crush on. I often like have crushes on buildings and like trucks, and I kind of like, oh, oh, until like feels right, and then I make them. Um, the Gray was over here, and downtown was over here, so I drove past it a lot. You know, I really started thinking, it's this vintage building, you can tell it's quite old, and thinking, did it go out of business because this family retired happily and moved on, or did it go out of business because there wasn't any business? And what's happened to those people? Where are they now? Um, Chinese restaurants also have an interesting and terrible history in the States. The Chinese Inclusion Act of 1882 and the following laws were set out to really restrict the types of jobs that Chinese people could have. They couldn't do any labor work. They could only kind of own businesses and these types of things. And that's why America has so many Chinese laundromats and Chinese restaurants. So, you know, moving across the states, trying to look at buildings and understand it, like there's this little piece of history, there's little bits of like information you can kind of see. So I made this piece. Oh, and actually this piece is now at Cam and Joanna's house hanging up. And I visited it yesterday, <laughs> which is funny. So these are found embroidery panels. This is the smallest thing I've ever made of clay that's real stupid. Clay's not meant to be that tiny. So that was a big like learning lesson for me. Lots of little seed beads. I like to mix up high-low art, which I don't agree with, but is something that exists. So, you know, beads, crafting. That's a chair that I found in the alley behind my studio in Lawrence, Kansas, and took it all apart and kind of reconfigured it and reupholstered it. Uh, this show is called Pat. This is my thesis show. It's made up of three buildings. This right here, this corner store is Pat's corner store. I grew across the street from it. So this piece was all kind of um, about Pat, essentially, and thinking back into that. I was in California when I decided that I wanted to make this piece about Pat. Um, it's just, yeah, it's kind of all started out there. Um, this one's from Kansas. This one's from San Jose. These are real buildings that exist in the world. All my buildings are, are made perfectly to scale from real places. For this show, I source all of my images using Google Maps. Um, Google Maps is a really amazing source and quite interesting to me because it's this like digital cloud version of the real world, and it also um, you can go back in time depending on where you are, like up to like 10, 15 years, so you can kind of see a place change and progress. You know, sometimes you'll see people or cars, and it's like this little record of these lives going on. So I decided I wanted to make a building from Kansas City. I wanted to be a brick building, I wanted to be from this certain industrial park. Um, and because of the history of Kansas City, I wanted it to be there, but I hadn't been here. So I went to Google Maps where I like, put my little person down and I just walked around until I found a building that I felt um, captured what I wanted. And then I went back in time to 2015 when it had some really great graffiti and I decided to make it from that point. This tire shop, though, was made three years prior to when I made it. It was by my grad school in San Jose. And when I was living in San Jose, it was the most expensive place to live in North America because of the tech boom and its Bay Area, Silicon Valley, um, which was a terrible place financially to go to grad school. But it was a fantastic experience. Um, when I lived there, this place was a tire shop, and I had all these big, naughty signs, and it, I just I hated it. But there's something about the building I was drawn to, so I went online and went back in time, and just three years prior, there was this like, little mom and pop shop. They had this really amazing sign with their little family business, and I just thought it was interesting. And again, like, could they not afford the rent? Like, what was going on? The Bay Area was lots of gentrification, crazy high rents, and just kind of thinking about that. I was also living there in the middle of one of their big droughts, although they're arguably just a drought now. But that really kind of affected the landscape as well. So for all of my uh, shows, I write a narrative artist statement that goes along with it. <coughs> and 
And if you wanted to read more of those, they're on my website. But I'm going to read you the one that I wrote for, excuse me, for this show. So I grinned eagerly as the heavy weight of change slid out of my small hand and onto his counter. <coughs> Sorry, choking on water. Pat reached under his shop register, retrieving a calculator just in time for my coins to quiet down their spinning staccato symphony. He divided my allowance and couch findings into one dollar piles, tapping into the calculator as he added the stacks and divided by five cents. He smiled as he turned the calculator face towards me. Seventy-eight of red. Greedily, I took the small plastic bag from his hand and spun around to kneel on the floor to collect my treasures. Seventy-eight five-cent candies. Seventy-eight delicious sour soothers that were sure to ruin my dinner this night, as well as a few times a week, every week, from the time I was old enough to cross the road alone until I moved away from home to go to college. <coughs> um, Pat also gave me 15 candies. <laughs> but it was delicious to get them. <laughs> As the years passed and I went home to see my parents, I would often cross the road to visit Pat for more of those candies. Pat was there every day, no questions asked, no holidays taken. Looking back now, I think he had two kids, maybe two sons, but I don't even know his last name. The years wore on his face and on his store. The shelves became sparse and the interior dingy, but thinking back now, maybe it was always that way. The naivety of childhood often glosses over the reality. The store has changed now, with a fresh coat of paint, new renters, and fancy yucky Easter tables outside. My brother brought my childhood home when my parents retired out to the coast, and he now lives across the street from Pat's old store. I called my brother from California to ask if he knows what happens to Pat, but he doesn't know either. So, I decided I wanted to make a show about Pat, go online in my studio, and I pull it up and I find this, and this is what kind of started this whole, like, wait, what happened? Like, that was a real staple of my childhood and, like, understanding of that place. And I went back just a year, and, again, the cool thing about this online digital space is that's Pat's red van that was always there. Pat was there, the store was open. I could just look out the window, the red van was there. We're getting candy. Uh, and then that's even Pat getting out of his van. So it's like I made a ceramic version of this building to like forever freeze this space. And then it's also kind of frozen digitally. Carly, does his family know you did this? I mean, that's such a cool thing. Yeah, I actually ended up trying to get his number. And I texted like a niece of his and told her, but she didn't respond. And I don't know if she told him. But I don't know how he would take that either. Like, it's not the most. Right. He might take it negative. I don't know. Like, I mean it with all of the honor I can, but also maybe for him it was just a job. But I would, I would love to talk to him. So, moving forward, I move off to Kansas. This is a piece that I made there called OK Google Take Me Home. I was moving a lot at that point, and I would move somewhere, and I would put my new address in my phone as home, so then I could tell my phone, OK Google Take Me Home, and she would turn on a GPS or take me home. Um, and I just thought it was like really rude that Google decided that that house was my home because it wasn't because I was just there and thinking about like what is home. Home can be people, it can be an art studio, it can be a bar, it can be a gallery, you know. So just thinking a lot about that, feeling very unmoored in all of this kind of movement in my life. So these are two buildings I made, both are out of Canada. Um, I made this bridge again. Not only can you control what goes in a gallery, you can control the way that people have to move around the gallery. So I like to kind of like control the flow. A bunch of pipes here. These pipes, they look like wood, but they're actually full of gold glitter, so petroleum and gas. I'm thinking a lot about that. I made this like sweet little overlook from the hills. So you can kind of sit and contemplate and think about it. But again, lots of mixed media, lots of wood, I guess. I clearly like using raw wood. So, um, you're probably noticing now that the houses look a little weird. So I'm actually going to go for a couple, because it best explains it. Oh, for this one I would just say LED lights again here, and this democratization. And especially I think about lights as I'm leaving the porch on for somebody to go home. I like that kind of ambiance. And it's like that little mm, architectural detail that I think really talks about humans and how we interact with these spaces. Uh, here we go. So this is a good picture where you can see that these are all made in two-point perspective. Do you guys know what that is? No? 
Well, let me just take a quick sip. Anybody want to explain it? Okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I just needed some moisture. So, two point perspective is something that uh, two dimensional people do, like drawers and painters. And you have a horizon line and two vanishing points. All of your vertical lines are straight up and down, and then your horizontal lines all go to those vanishing points. I'm sure you've seen lots of drawings like that. So this is using that technique, but in three dimensions. So my piece over there in the gallery, if you stand at the right spot, it looks in perspective, but as you move around, it's this like cheese wedge type of vibe. So I started doing that um, while I was in grad school, kind of for a couple reasons. Um, one, people thought that I was just buying model kits and putting together these pieces. And the whole point is that they're very laborious and I'm like honoring the labor that went into them and the skill and the technique. And also I wanted to kind of record this idea that it went from a real two-dimensional space, a three-dimensional space to online and back to me in this translation. And then primarily also it's this idea that you could see a white picket house fence with the bends in the, in the driveway and think everything's good, but behind that facade, you know, there can be credit card debt, there can be uh, divorce, like upset, like you never really know. So this idea of kind of like coming closer and investigating so this is it up on its pedestal. I'm really drawn to this like train trestle oil derrick um, kind of detail and seed beads. I'm currently obsessed with the little tiny glass beads. You like can't get much craftier and I love them so much. So after living in Kansas, I moved to Philly. I lived there for two years and I think that Philly continues to be the most impactful place I've lived um, for my art. And for me probably, uh, growing up in Canada, we, lost, we watched a lot of American TV, but you're always taught that like TV's not real. And then you get to the States and you're like, yo, TV's real. <laughs> yeah. I, I think, yeah, in grad school I was friends with a frat boy, and I was like, yo, can I see your frat house? And I went in, and it was like, gross, it smelled like beer, like I was like, TV's real, you've all been lying to me. <laughs> um, so living in Philly, I constantly felt like I was in like an episode of Law & Order or something, it was just like, it was quite interesting. But moving to Philly initially made me really sad and really angry. Philly has a lot of trash, a lot of blight, crumbling infrastructure, and it also has like areas of like obscene wealth. And I wasn't making any money, uh, so I lived in a rougher neighborhood. And then I would go visit my friends and get drinks in the nicer neighborhood. The nicer neighborhood had like garbage cans and like street lights that worked and like roads that weren't like full of holes and just like really seeing that wealth disparity and being like what the richest country in the world like what is going on here and just like very angry and sad because at the end of the day I'm not of this country and if something went bad I could call my parents and they'd send me money to get a ticket and I could fly to Canada and just being like how do I talk about this, can I talk about this, just kind of like trying to figure all of that out and my place in it. Um, so I spent the first few weeks, yeah, pretty miserable. I moved there to be the artist in residence and teach at the Tyler School of Art. So every day I would drive from my apartment to Tyler. And it was after living there for a few weeks that I really kind of started to see uh, the spirit of Philly and really start to like deeply fall in love. I love Philadelphia. There's this like gritty kind of like um, get or done attitude that they have and this like survival no matter what. Um, stunning architecture and the foundation of Philly was meant to be these like small grid houses close to the factory so that everybody could like own their home and get to work at these like union jobs and Philly was meant to be this like utopia, this American dream. And there was like there's still that in its DNA and there's a hopefulness in it. It's like all of these row houses are all kind of fallen down or they're overgrown, but they have these stunning uh, moldings at the top and all these little details. And like, even just kind of like the working class people were meant to have these like beautiful homes. And I just really started to fall in love with it and started to fill my phone up with like all these photos of Philly. And it all kind of came to a head in this show that I had at Greenwich House Pottery in New York City of these three buildings from Philly. And I had this, um, Show just before the pandemic hit, luckily, because otherwise it would have been canceled. So, yeah, my phone is just full of all these pictures of me driving around and like crushing on buildings. <laughs> so, this building is a couple blocks from my house where I lived, and I just really became enamored with it. 
This is an Oriel window, like what a beautiful accent. These layers of paint and layers of people. While I lived here, I think 1700 North 24th Ave is the title of the address of this building. I think the awning changed on it two times in the two years that I lived there. So again, put my little archaeologist hat on, went on to my Google and was like, what used to happen here? Like, I'm so curious. So going back in time, oops, that's forward in time. This is as far back as I can go. This is from 2007. This is when it's called Oxford Market, and this is the time that I chose to make this building. Uh, physically. And here, just trying to kind of understand, uh, Oxford Market is a street I lived on, so that's why it's Oxford. And then, that's a Dominican Republic flag on front of it. So that kind of gives you a clue. Was there a influx of Dominican immigrants at this time in the neighborhood? Like, one proud family? Like, kind of like, what, what was the makeup of this neighborhood? Especially when we're talking about American histories, or American city histories, and white flight, and all of these things. You know, neighborhoods, so much change happens in them, and they record all of these things. Uh, 2011, so just a few years later, the name has changed. You know, where did those people go? Uh, thinking too, like, as I have a pat, everybody has a pat, or a corner store, or a, I often have a sushi spot, a place that you get to know those people. So, this is a piece that I ended up making, and I made it, like I said, at the Oxford Market time. It's about this big, she's pretty big. Uh, this sign is all cross-stitched and the rest is all ceramic. Um, again, we can start to see the cheese wedge. This van, that's Vanny the van, that's a van that I like stalked and took photos of every day for two years. Yeah. I mean stalked, it was abandoned a lot, so I, I just drove past it. Um, I lived in Brewery Town, which was close to Tyler, and in the two years I lived in Brewery Town, gentrification was just like ripping down the street towards me, and it was interesting to see that, kind of be like, what does that mean to the people that live here, and then be like, oh shit, I'm the first white person in this area, like, I am the first sign of this, and yeah, like, what does that mean, how can I comment on it, and this van had been abandoned a lot. It's a work van. As somebody who works in construction, so I know that vans and tools are you know, like two most important things and you need them to work. It had been abandoned, so wondering if it was stolen or what happened. And then the lot that it was in, it's not in this, it's not actually beside here, it's in a lot a few blocks away. Um, over time, these construction fences went up and the van kept getting kind of moved around and more verbalized and more graffiti. And then eventually they started building a new they like tore down this beautiful building and put up this like hideous new like siding. Just gentrification killed killed Vanny in the van. And then one day I drove to school and Vanny was gone, and I was like, <sighs> so I made a piece about that. I could do a whole talk, and I've got like hundreds of pictures of the van, but we'll save that for another day. Twenty four six West Diamond Street. Uh, I used to turn right here every day to go to school. This place is really interesting to me because it was pretty dead during the day, but at night. When I come home from the studio at like midnight, 2 a.m., this place was like pumping. There were these like really fun lights that spun around here. The first year that I lived in Brewery Town, it was a food desert, meaning that there wasn't any um, grocery stores. And a lot of people in the neighborhood might not have money to have a car or get around, so you're getting all your food and everything from your corner store. Corner stores are also these like social hubs, like people just like hanging on the seat and chill. So it was just an interesting kind of focal point of this area. So obviously, ooh, we're going back in history. And this was interesting because just a few years previous, this is 2009. Wow, yeah. So within a year, this place was totally abandoned and somebody came in and they, and they, it's not gentrification so much, like this to me was like the neighborhood kind of coming back to life. So that to me was kind of this like hopeful story for this neighborhood. So here she is. Love her. She's one of my favorites. Again, these are all cross stitch by me. LED lights, and then this is electroluminescent wire, and actually spins. If this was a video, and I really wanted to like capture that because I'd be driving home at night, and I always thought cops were following me. But it's just like <laughs> the, the lights are so bright. So this, yeah, remains to be one of my favorite buildings. So this is 2038 West Clearfield Street. This one is in the gallery, just right there. So I was in my studio in Arizona, and I knew 
that I was going to make a show about Philly to go in New York City. So I had all these addresses of buildings that I liked. And I plugged it in, and I typed it in wrong, and it took me to this house. And it took me a couple weeks to actually feel comfortable making this piece. It's probably kind of one of the hardest pieces I've decided to make. Um, I always thought of myself as this kind of um, observer, unbiased observer of these places and these buildings and just telling these stories. But I thought that this building kind of told a bad story about Philly. <coughs> and I didn't know... Philly and New York had this like, kind of competition, so I didn't want to put a bad symbol of Philly in a New York gallery. And then I was like, oh shit, like, I was, like fall in love with this city and I'm protected with this city and like, I'm not unbiased. Uh, but I did end up deciding to do this building as I kind of looked at its history and thought to myself that like this is the real, this isn't happening in Philly, this is happening in cities everywhere. And it's true. Um, you know, it's not just kind of a one off case. This too, all these blocks would have been full of these row houses. These all would have been factory buildings, probably union jobs that they walked to. Like at some point, this was like a thriving neighborhood. So, again, we're going to go on our historical tour. So kind of going back in time, this is the time that I chose to make the building from. So 2018, you'll notice. Um, and it didn't, it was 2014, it wasn't that far back that I was able to find it with people living in it. But I love that there's a car out there, doors open, maybe they're bringing in groceries, hanging out. Um, somebody called this place home, somebody had Christmas here and birthdays here. And then this is as far back as I go, 2008, and I love that you can see three people just like hanging out on the soup, just like just being normal, and I really thought like those lives were worth kind of commemorating in this way. So this is a piece that you can see. She's over there. Um, this is like a 90s, like for like a kitchen table that I found at the thrift store that just it felt like it probably could have been in one of those homes. And then I quilted these placemats and runners with that same, with like a street pattern from the the real world. I mean, you guys can see those. You can see IRL. So, fast forwarding, pandemic hit, all this stuff happened, politics, I was real mad. Everybody was mad. I was going to make all this really mad art. And then I was like, man, the world is mad enough. I'm going to make something like funny and lighthearted. So, I decided to make um, dumpster fires and trash candles. <laughs> And then inside of them, these are the missing 2020 mail in ballots. Oh, I found them during my tiny candles. <laughs> Toilet paper and uh, hand sanitizer. And the funny thing is that like these pieces, this is like still relevant because like we're still doing it. And I just did a pre-sale for more of them and like, yeah. I mean, I might put some updated trash in them. I was thinking about the unused vaccines that have been thrown out. Topical, but... Uh, yeah, so I decided to like have a bit of fun and levity. Those little trash candles. <laughs> that project was a lot of fun to do. So moving on a bit to the piece. Ooh, I didn't know that sound. Um, that you guys see here. This is just kind of the making of it, which if you have questions we can talk about. It. Actually, you're all ceramic people, so you might. Little chunks of the track. Uh, the trucks are all slip cast. So I bought toy trucks, and then I made each truck as a seven-part mold, and then like the chairs are three-part molds, two-part molds for both bumpers, little steering wheel mold. Here's a view into my kiln of all of my scrap metal getting fired, and also on my table of all of that getting done. Another video of it in my classroom getting set up. So they're all in remote control bodies. Yay! Literally, we can go do this after this. Yeah, so thanks for coming, and I really appreciate it. Thanks, guys.